Well, good morning. So the purpose of repentance is not so someone won't kill you, but just thought that was a good clip. I actually looked at another movie that was really funny, but I couldn't play the clip. Uh, I want to say hi to everybody who's watching online. We got a bunch of people this morning, so I just want to say hi to a few of them, and you guys can give them a howdy in just a minute, all right? Uh, Marianne, we're glad you're watching, and Sandra and my mother. Randy, and your mother is watching from the hospital where her, his dad just had stem cell treatment, so she's watching this morning. We keep lifting your dad up, Lord. We ask you to just touch him now. Uh, Debbie, we're glad to see you this morning. And uh, Jen, it's good to see you this morning. And Karen, that's your mama. I see her name. Uh, Mark, who's home with COVID. How dare he stay away from that? Um, <clears throat> Paula and Joe. And uh, let's see who else I got here. Alan. Alan is in the panhandle. Yeah, you guys, you, you know what? They just need to move back. Because ever since they've moved there, you know where the storms are going. Well, actually, don't move back. Stay there, Alan. Stay there. Jimmy, Jim and Marjorie, we're glad to have you here. Your sweet wife is watching online this morning. Even though she came to church last night, she just can't get enough. Trisha Frazier, I haven't seen you in a while. I hope you're doing great. And uh, Terry and Barbara, and I don't get to say hi to everybody, but Larry, who's usually sitting in the back, is watching online today. Lots of folks. So we want to say howdy. Ready? One, two, three. Howdy. I can tell if you watch T-Hall because you said it very differently than everybody else. So my computer, we're going to talk about spiritual warfare today, and my computer screen got cracked this week, and it cost more to replace the computer screen than the computer. So I'm teaching from my iPad today, which should be interesting since I can't see very well because I'm old. Today we're going to talk about keys to true repentance. Now, we live in Florida. How many of you have ever spread grass seed? Anybody in here ever spread grass seed? All right, let's, and then I'm going to go to an even more general question. How many of you have ever planted anything. You've planted something. Okay, that's good. All right, so <clears throat> my yard, when we had our yard, uh, when we put sprinklers in our yard, the sprinkler guy came, and as he began uh, using a pickaxe to dig and put the sprinklers in, he said, did you know that your yard, part of your yard, has never been dug up? I said, what? I said, how do you know that? He said, because sand is like rock here. He said, I I've never seen it this bad. It's It's pressed, <clears throat> the sand itself is pressed down so hard, it's like rock. And I've realized that as even as I plant grass in my yard to get the grass to grow, I have to rake it and I have to break it up. And so today we're going to look at and use part of a sermon by Charles Finney or the idea from a sermon by Charles Finney about breaking up the fallow ground. Because here's what I know about you and about me. Just like grass seed won't grow unless you break up the fallow ground, some of us have been Christians for a long time. And without knowing it, we've allowed ways of thinking, we've allowed sinful thinking, we've allowed selfishness, we've even allowed habits that don't just hurt ourselves, but they hurt other people, and we're not even aware of them. And so today we're going to talk about all of these attitudes and how repentance, just like uh, the rake breaks up the ground, how repentance can, can make the ground workable again. Why? So that as God's word, as you read the Bible, God throws seed in your life. And as you're humble before him, guess what happens? You begin to grow again. So if your Christian life has become a little dry or you find that you're frustrated a lot or worried a lot or aggravated a lot, this could be uh, uh, one of the messages that will really help you uh, to find your way uh, to grow. How many of you have ever had something in your teeth and somebody had to point it out? Anybody ever had that happen? Isn't that wonderful? What a wonderful feeling. Um, I've actually gone home from church and one week I had my shirt on inside out and no one at church told me. That's the kind of friends I have here. You can either think they care too much or care too little or they just don't notice. The truth is we've all gone and done something and then looked in the mirror and went, oh no. Because we never really looked at ourselves. We didn't know what was going on. Too often, we're so busy just going through life that we don't look at ourselves. Now, we're going to look at Daniel. And this is uh, uh, written when we look at Daniel uh, chapter 9. And we're going to look at part of chapter 9, part of chapter 10. Daniel, think about it, was one of the most righteous people of his time. Probably the most righteous person of his time. He dealt with already being dragged out of town. 
He had seen Jeremiah walking around Israel saying, or Jerusalem saying, hey, Jerusalem's going to fall. False prophets then would come and say, uh, uh, don't listen to him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. They actually threw Jeremiah in a well. They were no friend of his. He would not share his wine. So they threw him. He was not a bullfrog. But they threw him in a well. They got so mad at him. They wanted him to sink to the bottom of this well and die. But he didn't. Uh, one of his buddies pulled him out. And so Daniel saw all of this. He saw then that Jeremiah was right. As he got dragged out of town, Daniel with his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were walked across the desert into Babylon. And then, of course, we know all the different stories about Babylon we've talked about in the last few weeks. We've talked about uh, uh, even Daniel in the lion's den. A man who did what's right no matter what was going on. And yet, <clears throat> when you look at Daniel in these chapters, what's he doing? He's repenting of sin. But not just sin of his own. Sin of his people. Now, he doesn't focus on the government at this time. He doesn't focus on the government of Babylon and their sins. He doesn't focus on other rulers and their sins. What does he focus on? His people. In his case, the Jewish people. In our case, it would be Christians. Lord, forgive us of our sins. And so Daniel's looking at the book of Jeremiah. He's reading it and he realizes that it, it, uh, Jeremiah said it would be 70 years between the time of the fall and the time they'd go back. And he's realizing, I'm an old man and I'm not going to get to go back. He's remembering the time that Jeremiah said all this because it would be like if you're in your 80s today and you remember World War II. How many of you remember World War II? Some of our folks in here remember World War II. We know, don't raise your hand too high. You're like, well, I'm not that old, right? And so my mom talks about World War II. We have a lady who grew up in England that goes here to church that remembers the soldiers walking through the streets in England. The American soldiers, handsome as could be, walking through the streets of England. So Jeremiah's remembering what it was like to live in Jerusalem and knowing he won't get to go back. And then he writes this. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong. What's he doing? He's comparing how awesome and good God is to where they're at. God, this is how good you are. This is where we're at. Now, Daniel could have prayed, Lord, thank you that I'm more righteous than these other people around me. You know, I didn't do anything wrong. I got dragged here against my will and I followed you all along. But that's not what he does. He continues. He says, we have been wicked. We have rebelled. We've turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our ancestors. And to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous. But this day we're covered with shame. The people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all of Israel, both near and far. By the way, Israel was wiped out. Jerusalem was wiped out at this time. In all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. See, one of the things that Daniel would have remembered is he would have remembered temple sacrifice. And temple sacrifice, they would come in and they would sacrifice the lamb. And then they would go to the wash basin. And the wash basin was one of the few things. They didn't have regular mirrors back then. But the wash basin was bronze that was hammered out. So that when you looked in there, you actually could see yourself as you washed. He would have remembered the sacrifices. He would have remembered needing to be cleaned. He would have remembered looking in the mirror. Instead of looking across, looking and seeing your own sin in your own life. In Psalms 130, it says this, If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can with reverence serve you. What did he do? He looked back at the sins of his forefathers. He looked back and one by one he picked up each rock and he said, God, this is what we've done. 
You know, it's easy to look out the window and be like the lady who looked out at her neighbor's laundry and talked about how dingy it was and saw it on the line. And every day she would say to her husband, I can't believe how dingy their laundry is until one day she was out in the yard and the lady hung her laundry up and she said, wow, that laundry's not dingy. And she looked back and realized it wasn't the woman's laundry. It was her own windows. Too often we're just like that. We look at the sins of other people and boy, it's easy to see what they've done wrong, but it's very hard to see what's in our life. But when we humble ourselves and say, God, this is how righteous you are. So compared to other people, Lord, that's not the comparison. The comparison is to you. And so, Father, forgive us for where we fall when we fail. Lord, forgive me for this sin in my life. And you ask God to pick it up and turn it over. Now, I'm going to give you a resource. I think we were able to put this on the screen. If you want an extended time of repentance, I would encourage you, you can Google this. It's called Breaking Up the Fallow Ground. It's by Charles Finney. It's a sermon, but uh, uh, Keith Green and Melody Green, years way back in the 70s, back in the old days, uh, uh, they... uh, They printed up basically a guide to repentance from that sermon. And I would encourage you, it's a great way of just going through different areas of your life and saying, God, how am I doing in this area? God, how am I doing in this area? God, in this area of my life, would you show me any wayward way in me and just turn over that fallow ground? Let God lead you to repentance. Why? So that he can grow new things in your life. Number two, so we compare our righteousness to our sin and then we recognize Our need for mercy. Boy, we are funny about mercy, aren't we? Because when we're driving and we're on I-95 and we think we're going fast enough and somebody passes us, we think, what a maniac. And then we see a policeman and we go, thank God, get him, get him. And we've all had those moments when we were driving and all of a sudden the policeman came up as the person passed us and we thought, yes, we love justice. But we've also had that moment when maybe we weren't paying attention to our speed. At least that's what we told the officer. And we were driving and all of a sudden we saw a policeman and we suddenly don't want justice. We want mercy. Oh, I hope he didn't get me. When we pray, we need to recognize that all of us need mercy. Because God not only knows you, he knows all of your secret thoughts. That thing you thought today when you thought you were a little better than somebody else, that thought you had about that guy tailgating you, he he knows that. And so if we're honest, we realize, you know what, God, no matter how good I think I am, you see everything and I need your mercy. Give ear, our God, Daniel says in in verse 18, and hear, open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We don't make these requests to you because we're righteous. Basically, I'm not good enough. I haven't done anything to earn my way to make you answer my prayer. But because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act for your sake, my God. Do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. Daniel, who could have easily said... You know, God, I've been faithful to you my whole life and all these people have rebelled against you. Bless me. But what did he say? God, we've sinned. God, we've messed up. And even Daniel, in what seemingly is an amazing godly man, had weaknesses. And he knew his struggles. And he confessed them to the Lord. We have to all recognize that we need mercy. By the way, if you want to be a grateful person, if you want to treat other people better, begin to recognize where you rank compared to God's righteousness. And when you recognize, you know what? I need mercy. I don't need justice. I can't do enough good things to earn God's love for me. No matter how good I do, even my best things, Paul said, are filthy rags. Even the most I can do are just junk. And so, God, I need your mercy. And when you do that, you know what happens? You become merciful to other people. Because when you recognize that you're not earning your way to God and you're not, I can't believe nobody else serves around here. I'm the only one that works hard here. By the way, that just creates great relationships with other people, doesn't it? You've done it at your house. You've done it in your workplace. People do it at church. I'm the only one. If everybody was like me, boy, this church would be a great place. You know what that's called? Pride and arrogance. 
when you recognize, I need mercy. God, I serve you, not because anybody else is serving you, but because that's what you've called me to do. And when you do that, guess what? Then you're gracious with other people. When other people don't do what you do, you don't look at them and go, ha ha, I wish you were spiritual like me. Well, that's such a great way to help people find their way to the kingdom of God, isn't it? By the way, there's a great movie on Netflix called The Resurrection of Gavin Stone. It will remind you of the importance of a fellowship like this. I encourage you to watch that movie. I, I can't remember. I, it's a Christian movie, so I think it's clean. It's pretty. Have you seen it yet? That's, that one's worth seeing. In Matthew 9, Jesus says this to the Pharisees. By the way, every once in a while, somebody says, I don't think Jesus was sarcastic. Okay, let me point this one out. This is really good. On hearing this, so the religious leaders are basically questioning Jesus as usual. They think they're better than everybody else. They think they are the teacher above teachers. And Jesus says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. Time out. You know what he's saying here? Hey, guys, um... You have never really learned the Bible. You know, hey guys, um, you really should learn what this means. And then he says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. That's said over and over in the Old Testament, by the way. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Why? Because I've not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Jesus was reminding them. See, they thought we're not the sinners. They're the sinners. But Jesus was reminding them, hey, guess what? You are too. When you start to think you have it together and you're better than somebody else, you and I need to recognize that we're the ones that need a doctor. That's why we say, but for the grace of God, I would just be just like that guy holding that sign. But for the grace of God, I would be just like that person who I think's a jerk. By the way, we all know somebody who's a jerk. Everybody knows somebody who just, you're like, how can they be that way? Guess who doesn't know they're a jerk? That person. If they do, they brag about it or they joke about it because they don't really think they are. But when we recognize, God, I need your mercy too, it humbles us even in the worst situations. God, I need your mercy. Number three, we need to recognize that we're in a spiritual war. One of my favorite games years ago that you could never play anymore because a kid would get hurt and you'd get sued and they'd close the church. We used to do something called refrigerator box races. And we would line up about 50 kids. And they'd be in, in group five, five rows of 10 kids. And these kids would go across the gymnasium. They'd have to put a refrigerator box over themselves. They could grab the bottom of the refrigerator box. And they would have to run across the gym. Run around a cone that they couldn't see. Which was my favorite part. And then run back to where their team was. There was only one problem. They couldn't see. And so they would run, and it would inevitably happen every time. There'd be one team that's all jocks, you know, and these are the guys who are big. And so they'd run as fast as they could, and they would ram into the wall, and it was awesome. And they'd be ahead of everybody else, and they'd get back, and there'd be about two kids to go. And then the next guy would take off, and he'd try to go in a hurry, and he would run straight left. And you're like, where are you going? Now, the problem that happened is they also ran into other boxes full of kids. And so hospitalizations were frequent. So we didn't play that, play that game too often, but it was hilarious. But let me tell you what the guys who ran straight left didn't realize. They were running the wrong way. Too many times we think we're in battles with other people. Too many times we think we're in battles with circumstances. Can I tell you that most of the battles you're fighting today are here and here? Did you hear me? They're here and here. They're not with that other person. They're with how you think about that battle. They're, they're what's coming out of your heart and going to your head. And what's happening? There are, is spiritual warfare going on where the enemy is just planting thoughts. By the way, some of us had them planted really early. Some of you feel like you're no good today because years ago the enemy planted a, a seed in your mind. And that seed has grown and it's now a tree. And until you start to recognize that seed and that spiritual warfare, you will walk believing those things. It's like running with a refrigerator box. You don't know where you're at. What do you got to do? You got to take the refrigerator box off. 
Now, I'm going to read a passage that even my mom said, well, I don't think we've ever studied that in church, and I'm going to try to make a very complicated, very controversial, but very realistic passage that has some simple truths that you can know about spiritual warfare. Here it is. Daniel 10, 12 to 14. Then he, and we're talking about Gabriel, continued, do not be afraid. Gosh, it seems like he said that later to some lady about a baby or something. Right? Remember that? Okay. Apparently, that's kind of his opening line. Do not be afraid. I bring you... Oh, wait, that's next. Okay. Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard, and I've come in response to him. You're like, okay, God was answering my prayer. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Time out. What? You're telling me you were on the way here and it took you three weeks to get here because some prince of Persia person stopped you? Yeah, that's what I'm telling you. So who is this prince of Persia? Well, there's, there's two main things. We think it's either a demon, which is a fallen angel, or it's Satan himself. Which one is it? I don't know. But it also tells us that the enemy can be over an area. This area just happens to be modern-day Iran and maybe part of, oh, a place you've probably heard of recently called Afghanistan. Would that surprise you? So we need to be praying over people who travel into areas where the enemy may attack them. Now, let me give you the big picture, though. The good news is, if God did not want this 21 days to last, he could have stopped it. But God had something to do with Daniel during those 21 days. Sometimes when God doesn't answer your prayers when you want him to, it's not because he's not answering them, it's because he's working on you during the waiting. God does the most work when we're waiting, when we don't know what's next, when we're insecure, when we don't know what's happening. And then it continues. Then Michael... So Michael is the archangel, this, this, like the head angel. One of the chief princes came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. What in the world is that about? Now I've come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future for the vision concerns a time yet to come. So God lets Gabriel struggle a little bit and then he says to Michael, all right, go, go, go get him. Now, God could have done that three weeks before that. Why didn't he? Because God was working on Daniel. Are you in a time of waiting where you're praying and you don't see your prayer answered? Recognize that it might be a spiritual battle and it could also be that God is working on you. So let him. Let him work on you. Be aware of the spiritual battle. That person that you're mad at is not who you're really fighting with. You're fighting a spiritual battle. And by the way, that person you're fighting with, you have had that conversation 50 times more in your head than you had with that person. You have relived that 50 times. That is spiritual warfare. And so you say, God, would you help me to deal properly with this situation? Now, that has to do with forgiveness. By the way, forgiveness and and being friends with somebody are two totally different things. Desmond Tutu said, you can forgive somebody for taking your pen. And, and, but if they come to you and they don't give your pen back, you don't have to have a relationship with them. That's two totally different things. The reason some of us aren't aware of spiritual warfare is because of the sin that's in our lives. It's like that refrigerator box over our heads. We don't realize what's going on. So ask God, God, would you open my eyes as I get my heart and my life right with you? In Ephesians 6.10, it talks about spiritual warfare. And I don't have time to read the whole passage today, but here's what it says. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his woo, mighty <clears throat> puberty. <laughs> Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. By the way, this is written by a guy who was chained to a soldier at least three years. Can you imagine that? Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's... What's he doing? He's scheming. The devil knows how you think, so he's going to push all your buttons. He's like that preschooler, right? 
For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against that person, against that situation, against that boss, against that thing that's going on. It is against rulers, authorities, powers of the dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heaven realm. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so when the day of evil comes, you'll be able to stand your ground. And then it talks about doing everything to stand in the, in the different parts of the armor. What does it mean? It means you are walking in a battle and you have a choice. You can put the armor of God on you. You can pray. You can ask God to protect you. Or you can just get flopped around. Or as you go through life, you can say, God, would you make me sensitive to you? Now, I don't know if you remember the old antennas. Do you remember the old antennas years ago? And sometimes uh, you would be the antenna. Oh, I'm getting the game now. There's the dolphins. I see the Miami. Oh, wait, we don't want to watch this. That was bad. Okay, never mind. Right? So... You are the antenna. The truth is, for some of us, we need to be sensitive again to what God's doing around us. How do we do it? We have to plow up the fallow ground. Is there anything in your life where you're not agreeing with God? When you're not allowing God to speak into your life? Confess it to Him today. Take some time this week if you can. Look up that fallow ground and maybe take an hour. Print it up. Take an hour and sit with a pen or a pencil and just write down, God, here's the areas. And when you're done... You can tear it up. You can put it in the shredder and say, God, thank you that you've forgiven me. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ or you're watching online, I'd love to talk to you about what it means. If you're watching online, you can send me a note. If you're here, I'd love to talk to you after the service of what it means that Jesus died for your sins because you couldn't earn your way to him. And when you confess your sins, when you surrender to him, when you become a disciple of his, the Bible says that he takes your sin and gives you his righteousness. If you're a Christian here today, and as I spoke, you thought of a relationship, you thought of a situation, I want to encourage you, hey, take that to God in prayer. Make it spiritual warfare in your life that you will continue to pray and ask God to give you the right attitude, the right heart, the right thinking about that situation, that person. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these moments. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your power, your strength. I thank you for all those here and watching online. May we Plow up the fallow ground in our lives so that you can plant new seeds. Lord, may we be sensitive to you. May we be sensitive to the spiritual battle. May we pray for those in our communities. But Father, we also want to lift up Christians in America and around the world that we would be an example of who you are. Lord, make that true in our lives. Father, for each of us today, we surrender our hearts and minds to you. Clear our eyes to see your will in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen.